and colleagues do is extend the standard compartmental epidemiological models in order to allow for an economic component. And they use these new models to study optimal policy to the pandemic. And when I say optimal policy, both with regards to the economy and also with uh, the different non-economic measures, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, as they're called. So although this is a step forward from this point of view, uh, because it takes into account human action with some specific assumptions, obviously, but it does. And at the same time, it provides economic insights which are needed. This type of work has some important limitations. So one is uh, that this literature assumes perfect information and optimal responses of individuals, which even though there are some models, and here I cite one of my papers with uh, Corrado de Guilmi and uh, Yorgos Bascosos, most of the models in this literature, by assuming this perfect information and optimal responses, does not take into account the fact that even the epidemiologists and the physicians and all of the people who are working in this literature do not have enough information uh, about the epidemiological issues themselves. And at the same time, although they take into account human action, they do not incorporate other relevant social conditions. So for this reason, this literature only partly addresses the limitations that I mentioned in the previous slide. So this means that there is still a gap that exists and needs to be addressed, which is to identify relevant socioeconomic conditions that can be entered in different models. But by thinking about this, this is not only with regards to COVID-19, but it becomes a more general question. And this is uh, the motivation of this work, the general motivation, which are the conditions that we should be including and taking into account, which is a political economy question, if you want. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is broadly two things. First, I'm going to discuss financialization and health. So I will identify financialization as a category that should be taken or should it be taken into account when discussing health issues. And uh, the second part, I will focus more on COVID-19 and some work that we've been doing, thinking about questions uh, related to COVID-19. So, and uh, as the time is passing, I will go straight to the first thing I want to discuss. So our starting point of this work, given that we want to take into account relevant social conditions, we start from the relevant literature in disciplines like social medicine and social epidemiology to see uh, what are the different social issues that we should take into account. And this literature, uh, the key point of this literature is what is known as social determinants of health. What are social determinants of health? It's a literature which discusses the fact that the conditions that people live and live in and work strongly influence their health and their health outcomes. And it's important to notice two things here, that on one hand, we see that differences in health outcomes constitute a type of social injustice, and this is why it's important to take this into account. But at the same time, uh, social injustices have an impact on social outcomes. So you could think of this as a two ways uh, connection. So there are several social determinants of health, and some of the ones that we've been thinking are more interesting from a political economy point of view are related to social exclusion, social support, work and employment. So from this point of view, we can think, thinking of this specific uh, social determinants of health, what are the political economy 
foundations of this. So more specifically, can we think of underlying political and economic processes which influence this relevant social determinants of health? Obviously, one is neoliberalism. As political economists, we can identify broadly three easily. Neoliberalism would be the first. Globalization would be the second one. And financialization would be the third type of process that influences this uh, social determinants of health. Although there has been more work on the first two, and I mentioned some papers here, there is much less work on financialization. And this is where uh, our contribution is in a way. With regards to financialization, we can think of two types of effects. There are direct effects, and there has been a work on this, uh, some work on this, and these direct effects have to do with changes of uh, healthcare systems governance due to the reliance of global and also local health on financial markets and the changes that have been happening due to the financialization process uh, on financial markets. Moreover, on the impact that these changes are having on health and health outcomes, but also equality. So this has to do with direct effects and some work has been happening on the direct effects. But what we think is equally or even more interesting is the indirect effects, which have to do with how the financialization process over the last 40 years has influenced relevant uh, social determinants of health. And this leads to some open questions like, is there a financialization inequality health nexus? And obviously the answer of this type of question will vary across countries. And then another type of question or a category of questions has to do with the severity of COVID-19 with regards to financialization. So up to here, I've made just a point that there could be some interesting links with regards to financialization and on health. And only a very, very small part of this has been discussed. So our contribution is at this stage has been mainly to identify possible links. Now, with regards to the second part of the presentation, um, it has to do more specifically with COVID. So we want to shift the focus from broad health issues to the current pandemic. And we're thinking, uh, is there a link to financialization? So this is very preliminary work, as I said. So the starting point is the relationship between financialization and health. But then if there is a link, then this link may be will have some kind, uh, maybe it can be visible through the way that the current crisis is being unfolded. So there are data with regards to infection dynamics across different countries. So here we see the daily rates of infection of COVID and we have different countries and we see that we have United Kingdom, Spain, Italy, Chile, Brazil, and Iran. And we see that there is a similarity. We see the first wave. And there is a similarity because we see that there is a reduction in all cases. However, we see also several differences from this point of view. Also, the level uh, has been quite different across countries. We have chosen the daily rate of infection rather than total cases or new cases because, as I will discuss uh, later when introducing a model, this is uh, a good proxy to see what is happening, how the dynamics unfold. Um, so, 
we see that the infection rates uh, vary across countries. But from a political economy point of view, I think it's a bit more interesting to look especially at the developing world. Why? Because there is less space, comparatively less space for physical distancing. And this is both from the point of view of the different governments and also from the point of view of individuals. So we can think that uh, governments have less fiscal space to put forward non-pharmaceutical interventions which aim to reduce the number of interactions across individuals such that the infection rates uh, fall but at the same time individuals may have less possibilities to include to decrease their interactions their social interactions so from this point of view, in developing countries, social and economic factors are more relevant for a political economy type of question. Obviously, in the developed world, there are also questions, but there it's more a question, if you want, of political will compared to the developing world, where apart from the political will, there are also other issues, as I will discuss. Now, let's look what happens in the, con in, in the contagion dynamics across different developing countries. So here we have a panel of uh, 12 countries, but we see that we have quite some difference with regards to how contagion uh, has evolved, right? So we see what is happening in Brazil, what is happening in uh, Chile, Colombia, etc. So what we would be interested more here is the shape. So how many, what was the level of contagion initially, and then how this evolved after measures were taken. Okay, so we see different countries having different shapes, if you want. So this is the kind of question. So we, we would think that, uh, OK, by analyzing this, can we think of different political economy links? And in our case, could there be links with regards to financialization? Although I'm not going to give a full answer with regards to this, I will just present some kind of stylized facts. So here, we see a table, we have different countries in the first column, and in the second and third columns, we have different proxies of two different proxies of degrees of financialization. So in the first column, we have domestic credit to private sector as a percentage of GDP. And in this in the in this column, we have domestic credit to the private sector by banks as a percentage of GDP as well. So this means that based on this characterization, Chile is more financialized compared to Jordan, Jordan more financialized compared to Brazil, etc. At the same time, we see another measure here. You can see broadly these two measures uh, go hand in hand. So based on this, we can have a rank of financialization, a simple rank of financialization uh, across different countries. The last column here uh, captures the dates that non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, were imposed. So broadly, they have been more or less around the same period. So it's between middle and uh, late March. So it seems that the earliest one is 13th of March and the latest one is uh, 26th of March. So why is this important? Is because if we want to check the contagion dynamics, we have to have a broadly the same starting point across countries. And this in a way gives us this starting point. So based on this characterization, the fact that we have 
some kind of the same starting point across countries, we can have some preliminary understanding of, if you want, uh, some stylized facts with regards to financialization and contagion dynamics. So here we have uh, we have compared two countries with regards a more, as you can see, for instance, here, South Africa is very financialized and Mexico, which is the other country that we have here, is, uh, is lower. So we're checking, this is just an example, we could do this with many countries, but we get very similar characteristics. So what we see is even though they took the measures uh, at the same time, we can see that actually there has been a decrease in, in Mexico, while South Africa is, is more stable, if you want. Here we can see a similar kind of, uh, of, of infection dynamics with respect to Chile and Iran. So again, as we can see from here, Iran is in general uh, less financialized than Chile. And uh, we see that the more financialized country is, it takes longer for the contagion dynamics to fall. So note that these are just stylized facts. We're not saying that financialization can fully give you an idea with regards to contagion dynamics across countries. We're just noting that more financialized countries are on average, the are more difficult, even though they took at the same time measures, it's more difficult. We see less of a fall in uh, the daily rate of infection compared to um, less financialized countries. So although this is stylized facts, then this raises a question, is this a coincidence? So, and then based on this, we go back to our general kind of framework. In order to see if this is a coincidence, we can think uh, of, we have to think or of where the contagion dynamics come from. So in order to think of the contagion dynamics, we start from uh, a baseline compartmental model, and this is the most simple one. So what do compartmental models do? They split the population in compartments. So in the most simple one, we have three compartments, susceptible individuals, infected individuals, and recovered or removed individuals. This can capture more the uh, both the people who are recovered, but also the people who die. And this model says is the dynamics uh, that capture the way that people move from one compartment to another is given by three differential or difference equations, difference equations in this case. So this says that the change of uh, susceptible individuals is given by uh, this here, beta times the number of susceptible individuals times the number of infected over the whole population. So it says in different words, the number of, the higher the number of susceptible and infected individuals. So this model assumes that uh, the removed individuals have uh, some level of immunity. So the more the more people are immune, the less this will be. So the more easily people will get infected. And the number of infected people is captured by the probability of someone getting infected per time step. And this beta captures this probability for a given number of susceptible and uh, susceptible and infected individuals. More specifically, this uh, term beta here captures the probability of someone being infected. So it captures two things. It has the characteristic of the virus and 
the characteristic of and the probability of meeting someone. So when people take uh, physical distancing measures, it means that they meet that they meet less people. So this beta will become lower. The infection dynamics are captured by the second equation here, which says that the number of infected individuals grows by the same rate as we see here. And then at each time step, uh, a part of the infected individuals becomes recovered. Oh, sorry. So because this says per time step, a fraction gamma becomes recovered, as we can see here as well, this intuitively means that one over gamma captures the the time period, the average time period that an infected individual remains infected because before becoming recovered or removed. So from this point of view, beta over gamma or beta times one over gamma, it's the same thing, captures the reproduction rate of of uh, the the virus. As we see, the dynamics depend crucially on beta. But, and this is how we get back into the original question, this beta, because it's related to, to the number of individuals, each susceptible individual meets per day, this is socially determined. It depends both on the choices, people meeting other people, but also what the government is doing and is able to do. And we have another paper with Adam Hania, which we discuss this in more detail. So beta depends both on different states' financial ability, also political will, to implement physical distancing measures, and at the same time, individuals' economic and social ability to act, and willing as well, to act according to these measures. So it says that state may be able to impose measures or may be willing to impose measures, uh, but these measures can vary. For instance, it's a different thing saying to people that you will get furloughed but still get paid or say to people you shouldn't go to work, but if you don't go, you will not get paid. This will have on individuals uh, possibility of following these measures or not. And as I mentioned before, this is especially relevant in developing countries because the political will, uh, although it will be important, it is important, uh, also financial ability, for instance, if you have to, to pay debt, uh, you have more constraints that put barriers to one's, one state's financial ability to take measures. So then the question is, we saw that there might be some kind of relationship between um, contagion dynamics and levels of financialization captured at least by these two variables. And uh, also we see that financialization, we know that it affects um, social determinants of health. So bringing these two together uh, leads to the question of more specifically, if we can see from relevant social determinants of health, which can influence this beta here, will be influenced by the financialization process, especially in developing countries that we, we uh, saw some data on. And this is the last part of this presentation. So what we have done is looking possible channels of financialization with respect to social determinants of health related to to the beta, to the physical distancing possibilities. So we have identified uh, five different possible channels that we need to look at in the future in more detail. And these are uh, first rising financial payments and the financialization of real investment, shareholder value orientation of uh, the financialization of corporate governance, Third, the financialization of households. Four, rising financial profits of non-financial firms. 
and five international aspects and effects on government spending. So all these channels are based on relevant financialization literature and specifically work that different colleagues have done uh, on developing countries. Let's have a look at each of the channels in a bit of more detail. So what does the first channel says? Uh, it says that during good times, firms become more optimistic and they want to invest more. But we know from Minsky that as desired investment rate rises, firms and investments become riskier and this leads to increase of debt ratios in order to cover funding gaps. So this is a very Minskyan idea. So this type of dynamic in the medium to long run has two types of effects. Uh, the first scenario is we have rising debt service commitments, which lead to a proportion of firms retain profits to go towards uh, debt repayments, which decreases uh, in real investment, which leads to a decrease in real investment because part goes there. And then this has uh, effect to rising unemployment and increased labor market competition. So then if you take this into account, if you have higher unemployment, the idea is that you would expect that people, if they find a job or then it will be harder to leave this job if the state is not providing uh, this measure. So if they have to go to the job every day, this will mean they will get in contact with more people, etc. So this beta that we discussed or the reproduction number, it will be harder to fall. A second scenario is that by having a uh, rising debt service commitments, this will lead to counterbalance uh, deteriorating financial position by cutting down other costs, which again will have an effect on wages, workplace safety expenditures and commercial real estate payments. So thinking of these conditions, then this will also have effects in uh, physical distancing measures or the opposite may lead to having more people in the same spaces. So you can see again an indirect effect on financialization on this beta. And overall, we can say from this channel, we see that uh, the higher the competition is in the job market, the more likely it will mean that workers will accept worsening workers' conditions, which will have an effect in the contagion dynamics within workplaces. The second channel has to do with shareholder value orientation and the financialization of corporate governance. So this has to do with the fact that we see due to the financialization process, a division between firm management and ownership and shareholders income is linked to the value of the company shares that shareholders hold. This leads to pressures to pressures of uh, the management of the companies to maximize shareholder value and take uh, relevant measures commonly through debt financed share buybacks. And there is a big literature on this. We've just mentioned some papers. And similarly to the previous case, we have effects in the medium to long run, which uh lead to rising unemployment and increased labor market competition and this is due to the fact that rising debt service commitments uh, leads to a bigger part of the retained profits to go to debt payments so you see the similarity with the minskian type of uh, idea that we discussed in the previous slide although through a different channel and then this leads to a decrease in real investment and then a second scenario, which rising debt service commitments leads to improve to financial position by cutting down, cutting down other costs. So we, we can see again a reduction in wages, workplace safety expenditures, 
and also commercial real estate payments. So you see again how this can increase both into the increase of possible contacts and bad measures within the workplaces from scenario two, and but also in general with regards to the conditions of the working class, both in scenarios one and two. So this is a different channel through which beta can be influenced. Third channel, financialization of, of households. So here we were, th we were thinking uh, in developing countries, and we mentioned some of the works there, uh, but there are also other works I will mention in, in the end, uh, also Ariane's uh, work on this financialization of households. And uh, so the idea here is that uh, the financialization of households has transformed invest uh, investor identities including working classes self-discipline and loss of aversion behavior it has this has uh, is related to rising debt commit uh, sorry commitments and the fear of debt default which leads to workers avoiding endangering their employment by negotiating more aggressively for uh, higher wages participating in unions and strikes Obviously, this varies across countries, and as Wood and Guzulis have shown, that in more social democratic market uh, economies where we have stronger unions, this effect have been smaller, and this can be different in more, if you want, liberal market economies. So again, we see through the financialization of households, the more vulnerable the workers are, the more likely it will become that they will accept worsening working conditions, which again will have effects both within the workplace, but also their choices with regards and their possibilities, not just choices, but the possibilities of taking physical distancing measures. Uh, I have to start wrapping up, so I will go quickly. Uh, financialization of uh, financial profits of non-financial firms. So the idea here is that financialization allows firms to obtain cheaper business credit to fund their investments and expand their activity to financial investments. And the idea here is again that similar effects to unemployment and labor market conditions and the, the more specific channel is that more financial firms can extract the more financial firms can extract profits through less labor intensive investment leads to gradually wealth accumulation becoming less dependent on labor and then higher unemployment and labor market competition as a, as a result of this which in the end leads to labor becoming more vulnerable so again through different channel uh, we have, we can see how physical distancing possibilities can be affected indirectly through financialization. And the last channel, which is a bit separate, so the first channels have to do more specifically to workers. The fifth channel and uh, is related more with the possibilities of states taking measures and there is a literature which discusses the financialization process in developing and emerging economies, uh, having an international impact and has focus between political economy issues and actions related to investments in financial products. And why is this important to us? Because through this literature, we know that financialization can have an effect on public spending. So this can have a, a direct effect on health spending, but also with regards to to different financing, different non-pharmaceutical interventions. And there are different works which have looked at this link. So I should mention at this point that uh, for simplicity, we have looked only at the physical distancing uh, 
possibilities, and but there are other possibilities one could look at, and these are related to deaths, for instance, and other outcomes which are not related necessarily to just the contagion dynamics. We could look at different dynamics, which again, financialization would play an important role, especially through the last channel, uh, through investment, public investment in health. So this could have an effect, for instance, death, the death rate per number of infected people. So just to conclude, our idea is that financialization can have an effect on health, which are both direct and have been discussed in the literature not too much, so there is more work there to be done. But to mainly raise the point that financialization can also have indirect effect on health through affecting uh, different social determinants of health. And this is the point that, to our knowledge, has not been made. And in a way, this is one of our key ideas. And uh, these effects can be understood and we can check these effects using data from the current pandemic. And by thinking both of these questions, more the general and the specific to the pandemic, leads to a new research agenda, which brings together areas like social epidemiology, uh, sociology of health with relevant works on financialization and political economy of financialization. And if we think of the pandemic, there is a crucial issue of financialization uh, with regards to space. And we can discuss more in the Q&A uh, session uh, after this. Just here to mention that uh, Ariane uh, Agunsoye uh, has done some work, some interesting work on this, which I think is can be very closely related. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It's exactly 39 minutes and 57 seconds, so I'm on time. Thank you.